Hi, good morning clients. We're going to start our webinar call for today. Today we have quite an extensive and full menu. We have, um, first we're going to feature our initiation we done last week, last Friday for Pioneer Tree Holdings. And then following which we have our strategy and technical updates, including for our Philip 20 portfolio. And then after that we have a whole list of results that occurred over the last week. But first off, we will start off with Banyan Tree. We issued a report last Friday, and um, this is uh, this must be a brand not unfamiliar for many of us. This is a homegrown hotel resort developer. So our title of the report goes: A New Era Through Partnerships. A lot of a lot of things have happened for Banyan Tree in the last six months, and um, why are we initiating on them at this juncture, at this period of time? is a lot to do with what has happened to them, a lot of a lot to do with the partnerships they have signed over the last six months. So you see that, um, okay, before that, I think we, I, I touch a bit of, about um, the company background first. The, the company now has 40 resorts in all and spread, acro spread across 25 countries. The business is centered around primarily four brands, but most of us should be more familiar with Banyan Tree brand and the Angsana brand. They have two other um, more mass market, more economical kind of brands in Kesia and Dawa. But those two are very new brands started just a couple of years ago. So some of us may not be too familiar with those two. But So all in all, four, four brands operating. And for Banyan Tree, what we saw happen to them is that in the past six months, they have signed partnerships with, I would say, leaders or giants in their own respective industries, in their own respective countries. We have we have um, one of the largest property developers in China, in Vanker. We have one of the biggest hotel operators in the world, in Accor Hotels, signing deals with a company with a market cap just a fraction of what these giants are worth. I think that speaks a lot about the kind of branding and the uh, the reputation that Banyan Tree has, and this strategic partnerships that the Vanka and Accor has signed with BTH Banyan Tree Holdings, they they offer a few they offer a range of benefits in the short term, in the mid term, and in the long term. First off, we have divestment gains, and then we have um, increase in management fee income, and then lastly we have fresh capital injection from these two partners into Banyan Tree. So the most immediate impact is the potential divestment gains for Banyan Tree of all their China assets into the joint venture with Vanka. This potentially could add a nine cents per share disposal gain and um, providing a bit of upside to dividends. <coughs> the deal with Arco on the other hand, um, we know that they are one of the largest hotel operators in the world. They are opening one hotel in, on average every one and a half days. Then you see that in the pipeline of um, this partnership between Accor and Banyan Tree, we project that the potential pipeline, potential number of new hotels the new partnership can do, can potentially push up Banyan Tree's hotel network from the current 40 to a final of um, to a final of 76, and that is not even including what Banyan Tree has on their own organic growth fund. So we have um, just three simple investment merits, and we think these are very key, very strong merits on their own, strong enough for us to have a 77, 77 cents um, target price, which we think is already is, is, is still on the conservative side, which I'll explain more on why that is so. In, in, a, in a later bit. So the three key investment merits. Firstly, I talked about the significant capital gains that you can expect when Banyan Tree divests their, their, all their China assets into the JV. Secondly, the partnership with uh, Vanker and Accor, they are likely to accelerate BTH, the growth with management fees. And lastly, we know that these two partners are going to potentially inject a total of 100 million sing into Banyan Tree. Uh, comparing with market cap now is about 400 over million. This capital injection 
is likely to enable to is likely to be to enable BTH to reduce their gearing, and um, at the same time reduce interest costs. So if we use let's say an average interest cost for them for one entry, we take it to be about four percent or five percent. Assuming a hundred million reduction in debt, you're going to save four to five million interest cost per year, and that's substantial. That's substantial given the magnitude of uh, entry's bottom line at the, current, at, the, at the current moment. So I will I will go on to touch on the first catalyst first, which is the most immediate, the most uh, near term one, and that is the expected capital gains when entry divests their China assets into the joint venture with China Banker. So what is going to happen in this JV is that the a new entity is going to be set up. The new entity is going to be called Banyan Tree China to be owned 50-50 between the two partners. And Vanker is going to be the one providing the capital. Banyan Tree is going to be the one providing the resorts as an equity injection. So they're going to inject four assets. As you can see here, this is the list of four. And um, number one is number one is an is a hotel management company that is that is the company that is providing all the management services to the China resorts and the hotels. So this is a, this this is an asset like company. This is a services company. Not much assets to it. Is is the one collecting all the fees. But two and three, two and three Laguna Chengdu and Banyan Tree Lijiang. These are what we believe constitutes the bulk of the valuation that you are seeing on the book right now. So as of uh, FY16, the total book value of this disposal group of uh, assets, the net assets value is 164 million. And like I said, uh, we believe that bulk of the valuation comes from the land and the property in 2 and 3, Chengdu and Lijiang. Banyan Tree Ringha is a very small resort, so we, we're going to just um, ignore that for the time being. So we will concentrate on two and three and we will try to estimate a market value for what these two assets are worth currently to try to get a, a hold on how much we think the potential valuation gains, revaluation gains can be. So I will start off with Chengdu first, Laguna Chengdu. We think that this is going to add a 16 million revaluation gain and how do we how do we come to that figure? So first off, the Guna Chengdu is a project. They are on this plot of land in Wenjiang and Chengdu that BTH acquired in, in 2012, late 2012. The plot of land is, is huge. It's about 216,000 square kilometers. So with that, I have to bring you to another, another picture. You look at this map of uh, Wenjiang. So this area highlighted in pink is Wenjiang where the plot of land for Banyan Tree is situated. Wenjiang is not a very big place. Wenjiang is just 270 plus square kilometers. It's about a third of the size of Singapore. So we try to get we try to get the average valuation of the land in the area to get a hold of um, to get a hold on how much the market value of the current plot of land is. So to get the market valuations, we actually saw that in October last year, there was a land tender. And um, on this site, which is 15 kilometers away from Banyan Tree's plot of land, 15 kilometers away, not very far, there were two plots of land separately sold for RMB 3009 to 4003 per square meters. Granted that these two plots of land are very much smaller than Banyan Trees, which is uh, easily 10 times what the one of the land plot is so for. So because of this bigger land plot, because we know that when land is transacted, when the land plot is bigger, typically they trade at a lower price per plot. So with that bigger land plot that Banyan Tree holds, we actually, to be on the prudent side, we take a 25% discount to the to the lower of the two transacted prices. So the lower of the two transacted prices is 3,009 per square meters, right? So we use a 25% discount, apply it to 3,009. We get a valuation of Rimming P 2,009 per square meters. And this is the number we use to value Banyan Tree's 
lot of land in Wenjiang. So using 2925 per square meters as a proxy, as a gauge, we arrive at a approximate land value of 126 million. This number is uh, 16 million higher than the 110 million that they are currently carrying on the books right now. And 16 million is actually 15% higher. So, so this is for Chengdu. So this 16 million revaluation gain is for Chengdu. And as a sanity check, we we compare what we have projected to be the gain in terms of percentage with average land prices for commercial properties in Chengdu. So from our database, you see that uh, this this price index from for property. Uh, for commercial properties in Chengdu, right, from 2012 to 16, in the four years since, um, in the four years since uh, Banyan Tree bought that piece of land, the average prices in Chengdu has risen 13 percent, which is actually not much if you compare it to other first tier cities. So, so this actually shows us and tells us that this 13 percent increase actually is not very far off from what we are projecting: 15 percent increase uh, for Chengdu for Banyan Trees to do plot of land. So from this, we we figure that our estimate is actually, I think, pretty logical and not out of work. So next I'll move on to, next I'll move on to Banyan Tree Lijiang. This is where a bulk of the valuation gain is going to come from because this one is, this is a resort which they bought, in, they opened in 2006. So you are looking at a ten-year You are looking at a, an appreciation over ten years, and we we all know how much. Uh, like we all saw the frenzy and the kind of appreciation that Chinese properties and land prices have gone up over the especially the last few years. Um, so. So we use again another um, the price index for average property prices in Li Jiang, because. Uh, in this vicinity, we actually found that there was a lack of comparable prices of land. So because of that, we actually use an estimate of growth rate that is consistent with um, what we see as the average rate of growth in the property prices from the index. And we see that from 2006, in the 10 years thereafter, property prices in Lijiang actually doubled. So with this kind of magnitude of gain, we, we actually assume that Disposal gain can be as much as a doubling of what they are carrying on the books as, as uh, at cost. So, right now on the books is a 51 million of PPE. We think that bulk of this 51 million is going to come from Lijia. It's going to come from Lijia because, as I mentioned, Ringha is a very small resort. So, with that assumption, that bulk of this 51 million is from Lijia, right? So, and we assume a doubling of uh, this uh, value in the properties. From this, from this resort and this plot of land alone, we are estimating a disposal gain of 50 million. And I think if you look at how much China property and land prices have risen over the last few years, to say that these property prices have doubled in 10 years is not far-fetched because for something to double in 10 years, you're just looking at a, an annual growth rate of about 7-8%, 7-8% Kegel. I think by China standards, it's not it's, it's really not too far fetched because if you look at some of the first tier, second tier cities in the past three years, easily in three years alone, some of them have doubled. So for this uh, Li Jiang, we say that we estimate that in ten years to double. I think it's pretty it's pretty uh, within same uh, projection limits. So all in all, just now I mentioned about first um, Chengdu is sixteen million. Lijiang is 50 million. So all in, we estimate that the total revaluation gains could come up to 66 million. If you add that to the book value, uh, potentially the valuation of the disposal group could come up to 230 million. So Banyan Tree is going to divest half of it into the JV as equity injection. This is their part. They, they are injecting properties, as I mentioned, and then Bunker is injecting cash, right? So they're injecting 50% and then the other 50% they're getting in cash. So potentially cash proceeds can be up to 115 million. So any any upsides to this uh, total revaluation gains can be 
can be a catalyst for further upgrade. So with this amount of cash that they're going to receive, we would not discount the possibility that um, uh, this potential proceeds can be potentially distributed as dividends because our rationale is that the, right now there is already ample cash on the balance sheet for what they need for their development properties. So, so this amount of injection of the capital of the cash could potentially be redistributed. So this provides an upside to dividends. So with that, I pass on to Peter to talk about the deal with Accor. Right, good morning, everyone. So we heard from De Hong, uh, we talked about Van Ker. So Van Ker will provide a short-term kicker to its, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the stock price. Uh, so for our course wise, uh, it's more of a medium to, uh, to, to, to long-term strategy for them. And uh, you will not get uh, immediate gratification for it, uh, I mean, in terms of this, uh, the development strategy. Okay, nevertheless, uh, let's quickly jump into the, uh, the key points of the strategic partnership. So first thing first is that uh, how it works between Accor and, and Banyan Trees. They will be co-developing hotels and service residences. So under the, uh, the four Banyan Tree brands, but more importantly, we believe that they are looking at the, the higher end brands, which is uh, Banyan Tree and Angsana. So the strategic partnership lasts about 12 years and it is extendable. Okay, um, Accor has subscribed for about uh, $24 million of uh, mandatory convertible debenture in, in, uh, in Banyan Tree Holdings. So the debenture has a, a com is convertible for a 5% stake in the company at a 60 cent strike price. And there is also an option to increase the stake to, to 10%. And finally, uh, how Banyan, Tree, Banyan Tree's role in, uh, in the strategic partnership is mainly to undertake brand management activities. And the key benefits for, for, for the partnership is that it allows Banyan Tree to, to leverage on a core strength and to uh, you allow them to, to drive new hotel expansions in, in new markets. And I'm um, uh, referring namely to Africa, the Middle East and, and the US. And our expectations is two to three new property launches per year uh, with an asset-like strategy and how it benefits Banyan Tree is uh, to its uh, uh, it'll be a, uh, a creative to its EBITDA in the longer term. And finally, it will expand clientele by leveraging on a course globally recognized loyalty program, which is the Club Accor Hotels. So we will uh, look into it in a more detail. Uh, uh, we will go into details in, uh, in in a slide later. So. Uh, in order to understand the, the, the partnership between the, the two companies, it's important also to understand where, uh, where Banyan Tree stands in the core strategy. So if you pay attention in the, the chart over here, uh, this is a summary of a course acquisition in, in the past one year. So they made about 10 acquisitions or, or, or about uh, uh, yes, uh, 10 acquisitions in the, in the past one year and Banyan Tree is, is, uh, is over here which is made in uh, December 2016. So the, the thing to take away from, from all these deals is that 9 out of 10 deals, they are focused in the luxury and upscale hospitality assets. And why is it so? It's because a cost portfolio uh, only have about 12% uh, in, uh, in this segment. So they are trying to uh, to, to bring up the game and step up in uh, in this particular segment, we will we'll, we'll look at it why in a uh, in a slight time. So uh, acquisitions in the main, in the in the past year has mainly been targeted in the in the high end segment. So like I said, uh, about uh, nine out of ten of them uh, is is in the upscale segment. <coughs> okay, so this is the the comparison between the largest hotel operator uh, in the world and. Um, one thing familiar over here is that uh, is that upscale and high and and and, uh, and the higher end hospitality assets uh, for huge I mean I mean uh, within the, the the three uh, the, the the three 
hotel operators. You, you can see like for, uh, for, for example, Hilton, Intercontinental and, and Marriott, they have at least about, uh, the, mini, the, the, low, the lowest is, uh, is Intercontinental, which is about 19% of it uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the upscale assets. And, and in terms of profitability-wise, uh, it brings in higher EBITDA margin of about 20% uh, or so. So the reason why I excluded Wingham is, is that uh, it's, a, it's a cost driver, it's a cost leader in, its, uh, in the industry, even though a uh, majority of its assets is in the, uh, the mid-scale and below uh, segment. So why is it important for them to, uh, to, to, to boost up the upscale assets? I mean, I'm referring to our call. It's because of mainly just it's mainly of two reasons. What I just shared this now is about a higher profitability. You can see that um, for Hilton, Intercontinental, and Marriott, even at, even for Intercontinental, at nineteen percent exposure to a uh, to the to the luxury segment, EBITDA margin can can go as much as uh, and uh, forty percent and upwards. So uh, it makes sense for them to uh, to to boost up exposure in this segment. And more importantly, the, the second reason is that it's less susceptible to, to disruptions from uh, sharing economy platforms such as Airbnb. Okay, uh, we, we are expecting the partnership to add about three to five new properties annually from 2020. So why 2020? It's because of the, uh, uh, it's because of the, uh, the kind of assets that uh, Binance Tree Holdings uh, that uh, the, the kind of assets that they that they that, that they build. So when we when we look at the product offerings of of Binance Tree, um, I'm referring to the to the resort segment. It's unlikely for them to. Uh, it, it's 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 unlike a traditional hotel where you can just acquire a new building. Wrong. I mean, you can just acquire an existing building, rebrand it, rename it, and and uh, and do some AEIs, and you can call it uh, say say for example, and call it in, call it their uh, their own assets. It's, it's different for, uh, for for resorts because what they, they need to do is greenfield developments. So what I'm saying is that they have to be uh, erected from scratch. And because of this, because of development time require, uh, the earliest contribution for, uh, for, uh, for, for these resorts is in 2020. So we're factoring uh, about a three-year development time frame, assuming that uh, they get a deal today. Now, uh, we think that three to five new properties is a realistic estimate because um, from the ten, about nine or ten acquisitions that the Accor has made in a year, they've added about 30 new hotels uh, to, to these brands in, in the past year. So on average, it's about uh, three, and three is actually uh, underselling it because uh, 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 in actual fact, that it was actually more than that. We can, we can add about 50 or 60 of these uh, uh, new, new hotels. Okay, so uh, the the third point over here is that uh, it will be a it will be a booster to its longer term EBITDA margin, and then we can have a look at these uh, numbers over here. So uh, uh, let's okay let's let's keep these uh these uh the, the, the numbers I mean like uh, uh the majority numbers. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, so just pay attention to 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 this part over here. But I think, Paulis. Uh, okay, I think I think uh, I think I think it's not a good idea to, to actually skip it. Like, uh, let's let's just let's just spend a bit more time here. Okay. So, uh, the assumptions is that I mean now on a hotel owner basis, uh, the number of keys for. Uh, for, for, for our mini exercise over here is that we're assuming about 115 keys. So why is it 115 keys is that uh, this is the average number of keys for uh, Banyan Trees, uh, I'm saying uh, Banyan Tree branded resident, uh, Banyan Tree 3 uh, branded hotels, so 115 keys. So RevPa is about $300, which is about a 20% discount to the, to the current RevPa, uh, talking about 1Q17. So, uh, it, so it's the same for uh, for for EBITDA margins, about 22% historically. So with these numbers, it gives us annual contribution about 12.6 million and 2.8 million dollars in uh, EBITDA contribution uh, based on the hotel owner. Then on the hotel operator basis, remember I was I was talking about the SLX strategy. So hotel operators, how they uh, they benefit from uh, from the uh, uh, from from hotel owners is that they. Uh, the revenue that they that they get 
is uh, this is this is an industry industry standard. So about uh, three percent of uh, for revenue and about ten percent gross operating profit. So finally, uh, we assume that it's a fifty fifty percent split between uh, Banyan Tree and and a core and brings us about three hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars in contribution per hotel. And the EBITDA contribution for, for Bayan Tree is about 230,000. And how, how do we make sense of this number is that uh, 230,000, if we multiply this by five, it's about, uh, about 1.15 million. And looking at it, I mean, there's the, uh, based on historical numbers, uh, because EBITDA margins, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, EBITDA contribution uh, in, in, the, in, in the past two years has been weak. So having something at like 1.5 million dollars uh, in contribution is it could be a matter of uh, of turning the corner or, or coming into the the positive territory. And finally, uh, we talk about the uh, gaining access to the globally recognized loyalty program, which is a uh, local uh, the club local hotels. It's not uh, the the thing to to pay attention over here is that so by entry does have a loyalty program, but it's nowhere as established as, as compared to uh, uh, the club or core hotels. And uh, to grow it organically or to grow it from, from scratch actually requires a lot of resources. And let's just go back uh, a few slides earlier and, uh, and have a look at, at this particular uh, acquisition by, by uh, core hotels here. So John Paul, it's, uh, it's, uh, they, they call it John Paul, an 80% stake last year in November 2016. John Paul is a leading concierge provider and um, they specifically they are uh, they are primarily exposed to the uh, to the to the upscale and, 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 and luxury segment. So John Paul is valued at about uh, 150 million. So 80% you're talking about easily a uh, 120 million USD acquisition. So if you match this against to uh, uh, to, to Banyan Tree's current market cap uh, I mean, they're talking about like, uh, so John Paul's acquisition about 120 million USD is about equivalently to about, say, 170 million Sing dollar. So that amount uh, is just for loyalty program. Can, can you, uh, I mean, it could be have, uh, it's not even used to uh, grow its, uh, the, it, it, it's called business segment. Okay, and uh, next is a uh, uh, peer comparison table. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to, to this slide. Uh, but I think let, let's get into the, the, the more juicy part, which is the, the, the valuation-wise. So valuation-wise, we are uh, using some of the parts. And our EV EBITDA multiple that uh, for, it, it, we use 10 and uh, versus the, uh, the, the large cap hotel operators, which is on average of 13.7. So uh, large cap peer average is, is here about 13.7. So small cap uh, peer average about 20.6. And at this point of time, uh, the company is trading at, uh, at 0.75 uh, book value, uh, which is which is uh, below the, the, the average of uh, 0.9 after the, the GFC period. Now, uh, we are using some of the parts to, uh, to, to value the, the company. So three, uh, three business segments. First is the uh, old hotel business. We use a 20% uh, discount to its uh, to, to fy 17s estimated book, uh, PPE's book value. So this is consistent with the current price uh, discount to book, but at the same time, we also maintain a conservative stance because it's uh, is is much low it's much lower compared to the uh, to the average price to uh, book discount of ten percent. And for its property development property development segment, we're using a thirty percent discount to RNAV and uh, assuming a twenty percent development margins. So thirty percent is is also consistent to what our in-house discount value that we use for mid-cap property developers. And finally, for its fee-based segment, uh, that, that's the reason why we, we, we shared about the EV EBITDA multiple uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a few slides before that. So we are using 10 and assuming a 30% EBITDA margin. So 30% EBITDA margin uh, is very consistent towards uh, what, was, uh, what, what was actually 
uh, what they actually made in the in the, in the past few years. So uh, we total this amount now. We get about a billion dollars, and we uh, if we include the the net debt position, brings us to about uh, five hundred eighty five million dollars. And divided by total number of shares, we get seventy seven cents. And the something else that I have to uh, that that I have to uh, that you have to take note of is that because of the uh, the valuation matter with some of the parts, we are only measuring the the value of the uh, the business segments. So it means is that we have actually not taken into account of the uh, of the underlying assets on this balance sheet. So there are two other uh, two two other components that that have not been taken into account is about is uh, uh, an investment properties as well as the uh, uh, associates that they own. So investment properties wise, they still about have about about seventy million dollars, and uh, they spend across land bank office properties and, and, and some shop fronts that they own uh, in Thailand and uh, Seychelles. So, uh, and uh, that's for the investment property segment. And in terms of associates, it also has a, uh, it owns a 7% stake in a public lease code which is listed in, uh, uh, in, in Thailand. So the name of the, the lease code is Taiwa. And the, the, the amount of stake that they own is about $30 million. So it total up these two uh, is about $100 million or easily another uh, 15 cents in the, uh, in the share price. But we have not taken account into, uh, 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 I mean, uh, on the, uh, the, the two assets. And uh, something else to mention is that uh, we have further upgrade catalysts. So uh, two, uh, two main ones is of course valuation gains. So uh, just now uh, when Dong mentioned about the uh, the, the bunker, bunker deal, we, uh, the amount that we use, it's, uh, it leans on the uh, conservative side. So uh, the, we, we might be expecting some, uh, some, some, some positivity from it. And secondly is the uh, uh, visibility of management fees from the, uh, from, from the two deals. Okay, uh, now we will move into, into results. So first stop, we have Capital Land. And uh, basically the second quarter of 2017, uh, the revenue has dropped about 12%. And this is mainly due to lower contribution from uh, Singapore development projects. So uh, if you are familiar with Capital Land, they do not have any new land on their balance sheet right now. So in terms of Singapore development property, they are basically just clearing whatever they have on their on their inventory. So EBIT wise is 67% higher because of a, a better performance in the China, China development projects as well as the uh, higher revaluation gains and absence of provisions made in uh, second quarter of 2016. And uh, provisions were made for the uh, 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 some Singapore development projects. Okay, and operating pet me, it has, uh, it has uh, apologies, there's a typo over here. So, uh, but operating pet mean we have uh, we have grown about uh, about uh, okay. These these numbers are, uh, are are wrong anyway. Uh, okay, let's 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 just skip these numbers here. Let's look at pet me. Pet me grow about ninety seven percent, and this is uh, mainly due to due to the newly acquired properties in uh, in in Japan. So there were higher contributions from there, as well as there was also a divestment in one of their. Uh, and office properties called Innov Tower. So just three key things here. Inventory, like I mentioned, inventory of unsold in, in Singapore has uh, continued to be wind down. So risk of ABSD clawback has been uh, greatly reduced. And we are referring, what we are referring to is the uh, is this particular development project called Victoria Park Villas. So at this point of time, it's about 60% sold. They have about one year more uh, to go before uh, ABSD uh, kicks in. And um, just in one quarter itself, they saw about 40 units. And 40 units is about 40%. And we think that it has moved tremendously uh, compared, to, uh, com compared to, the, to the first quarter of this year. So uh, more to be seen. And second point is that the uh, sales value recognized from handover of China residential properties 
was higher uh, despite lesser units handover. So what I mean by this is that uh, it's because of the, the reason why we are saying this is because of the uh, higher ASPs that uh, that the that the China residential properties were involved. So there were uh, more more recognition came from uh, this thing called the uh, 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 came from the uh, normal residential units. So uh, sorry, I mean just just to put this in perspective. Last year they sold more of these township units. So township units are more uh, uh, called uh, affordable housing, and therefore ASPs are much lower. And how low are they? It can be uh, something like uh, uh, sixty percent uh, lower than compared to a to a normal condominium unit. Yes, and that's the reason why, uh, despite selling, despite hand, lesser handovers, so lesser volume of handover, uh, sales value recognized is still higher compared to uh, last year. And next thing to 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 of course is that uh, all eyes is on Singapore property development. You can expect them to tender for more land, and that's because uh, two uh, because of two reasons. Uh, first thing first is the improving sentiments. As well as they are, they have uh, their land bank position is fully depleted in Singapore. And finally, uh, for its performance of a Singapore more property uh, portfolio, uh, apologies, uh, it continues to be to be uh, lackluster. Uh, good morning. Okay, um, I'm Jeremy. I'm uh, presenting the Singapore Investment and Finance and EPS results. So, um, Singapore Investment and Finance second quarter results is um, uh, very much in line with our expectation and is on track for uh, 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 massive um, PME growth. And I think the key thing about this massive PME growth is that it is um, it's a kind of strategy which they can control, and when I mean that they can control, is the uh, profit growth from uh, improving the deposit costs. So, uh, as we and also um, through improving the deposit costs, your the LDR, the loan to deposit ratio, uh, will be expanded, and therefore that it would actually um, uh, improve the net profit. So the as uh, what we see here is that the net uh, interest income grew 16% higher year on year as the LDR ratio improved, uh, expanded from 82% to 89% and the deposit cost um, in our own estimation uh, has improved to annualized rate from um, okay, sorry okay there's a typo here the annualized rate should be from 1.4% a uh, year ago to 1.2 percent. Uh, this quarter, uh, sorry, uh, annualized rate of 1.2 percent this quarter from 1.4 percent in the first quarter of 2017. And the net interest margins have um, improved uh, from 1.67 percent in the first quarter to 1.72 percent in the second quarter uh, this current quarter. And um, this is on track to uh, improve further to the end of year that in, our, in our estimates to be 1.77%. Uh, so this um, net interest margin improvements would be driven more by rates rather than volume uh, as we expect the pass-through of higher rates to, to have a, a slightly negative impact on the loans volume. Uh, while the on the cost side, deposit cost side, they will be trimming off the higher cost uh, deposits, and therefore the volumes on the on the deposit side would also come down. So the the mechanism for uh, uh, expanded LDR would be the you you be losing more of the high cost deposits faster than uh, you uh, lose uh, loans that cannot accept the pass through of higher rates. The allowances, uh, on the other hand, was higher than. Uh, than expected, but it was offset by uh, sale of uh, some uh, offset by the gains from the sale of uh, uh, the Singapore government securities. Uh, we see that the there's opportunities for uh, SIF to uh, gain from 
selling the 10-year SGS bond, uh, SGS uh, securities, as the bond price, as this 10-year bond prices have exceeded uh, the longer maturity SGS uh, bond prices. So you you sell off the 10-year and then you probably re reinvest them in the high maturity, like the 15-20 uh, year um, uh, maturity bonds, and you can reinvest them with at a higher yield. And uh, we estimate about uh, we estimate the interest income from the SGS uh, securities to be about 11% of the uh, net interest income. So next will be a DBS Group Holdings. Okay, um, the main theme for us DBS is that uh, the total income um, has uh, has been flat year on year. And um, the flat total income does not support the rising uh, pr provision expense, or in that sense, moving ahead if provision expense were to surprise on uh, on the downside. So th th there's two main problems here uh, moving forward in operationally is that if um, income is un income total income is unable to rise high or maybe because of the market unfavorable markets or basically because of operational uh, headwinds and the quality side of the assets deteriorates further and that's uh, required uh, that requires a higher provisioning then uh, it will definitely impact the net profit moving ahead um, as we can already see that the coverage ratio uh, has deteriorated from 103 percent uh, to the current 100%, despite uh, 350 million uh, gain from the sale of PWC uh, building in the first quarter was used to help uh, boost up the general provisions, right? And this is mainly because um, as total income growth is weak owing to the weak insti uh, institutional bank banking group and also the weak uh, treasury customer income. So um, the only bright spot that we can see here is the wealth management income, uh, which is up 21% uh, year on year. Uh, but the wealth management income makes up only about 17% of the total income. So uh, this component, we believe, uh, is not enough to offset the weakness from the institutional banking side and also the uh, uh, treasury markets uh, income. Um, also, at the same time, the retail income, which is part of the consumer banking group, is also showing signs of sluggishness. Okay, that end, ends my presentation. Next, we have uh, uh, Guangzhou to present on Semcore Industries. Thanks. Hi, it's Guangzhou here. So next we will talk about the results from uh, Sample Industries. Our title is Singapore Shines While India Times. Um, we maintain our rating of Accumulate with unchanged target price of uh, $3.50 and the last done price was uh, $3.18. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, so the top line revenue went up by 18% to $4.4 billion. Uh, this was due to the steady um, operations from Utility Singapore as well as the India. Um, however, the um, well-performed um, utilities uh, segment results was offset by the decrease or weak performance uh, from Marine's uh, operation. So in terms of uh, gross profit, um, it only went up by less than 2%. This was due to the um, lower profit margin from um, marine segment. And we, here we should know that um, because of um, higher borrowing costs from marine as well as uh, the one-off uh, refinancing cost from SGPL, uh, the profit before uh, tax down by around 15%. So the PEPME uh, down around was down around 
uh, which was in line with the um, PBT. So, um, in conclusion, uh, the in the first half of this uh, year, the utility Singapore operation actually outperformed the expectation. As you can see here, the net profit from Singapore market arrived at uh, around 76 million with uh, close to 30% year-on-year growth. This was due to the improvement of centralized utilities and gas divisions despite the local uh, intense competition. However, the uh, India's operation weakened because the second thermal plant SGPL uh, continued to suffer from the fluctuation of short-term uh, tariff. Because uh, as of uh, June this year, uh, SGPL has not secured any uh, long-term power purchase agreements, PPAs. So um, we expect that, uh, and also, sorry, and also the management uh, mentioned that uh, it probably take two to three years time to secure the long-term PPAs. So we expect that uh, SGPL will continue to suffer from uh, startup uh, losses uh, for the rest of these years. As for marine segment, uh, we already knew the results uh, last week. So uh, we expect that uh, Semco Marine will continue to check the group's uh, profitability due to the uh, draining of net order books. Uh, since uh, Semco Marine has not secured any uh, substantial new contracts, we think that uh, the outlook for Sam Marine's uh, operation is still uh, positive. And the last thing we should note is that um, the management uh, reiterated that the strategic review uh, is was on check. So hopefully they will complete this uh, strategic review by uh, end of this uh, financial year. So next is okay. Lindsay to um, talk about the uh, Raffles Medical Group. Thank you, Guangzhou. So uh, Raffles Medical. Uh, we have downgraded uh, Raffles Med from accumulate to neutral with a lower target price of uh, $1.27. The previous target price was uh, $1.49. So today I would like to drive uh, to you three main points. So what happened in the past uh, that caused the flattish uh, revenue as well as earnings? Uh, that was because of uh, lower patient volume uh, as seen uh, for the past six months. And uh, the second thing that I would like to uh, point out is uh, the persistent uh, high staff cost pressure um, as uh, Raffles Meds uh, ramp up their capacity. So um, the group actually uh, targets to reach a, a staff cost as a percentage of revenue at uh, 50%. But in the past few quarters, we have been seeing that um, staff cost has uh, been uh, remaining uh, above 50 percent. So in the last, in the second quarter of 2017, we see uh, the percentage uh, ratio at uh, 51 percent. And that actually increased uh, one percentage point uh, year on year. And uh, the third point will be uh, on the outlook where we see that um, the the uh, outlook will remain uh, challenging for Raffles Met and hence uh, our downgrading. Um, two reasons uh, behind uh, the downgrading. Firstly, because of the cost pressure. So uh, as mentioned, as they ramp up uh, capacity, they are going to continue their recruitment drive um, for their Raffles Hospital extension, uh, which would be opening in the uh, fourth quarter this year, and the two new China uh, hospitals as well. 
So uh, we see that uh, cost uh, pressure from uh, staff costs will continue to drag profitability until the uh, patient volume picks up. And uh, the second uh, reason being that um, they are going to open their two new uh, China hospital, uh, Raffles Hospital Chongqing and uh, Raffles Hospital Shanghai. Uh, in second half of uh, 2018 and second half of 2019, respectively. So we are uh, expecting a three years of gestation period uh, before they break even and uh, before they uh, gain uh, traction. With that, uh, these two uh, factors will continue to uh, drag on profitability. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to pass the presentation uh, to Jeremy, uh, who will present on the Philip 20. Guys, Jeremy here. So, for my part, uh, I'll be going through briefly the Philip 20 portfolio, which is the technical portfolio that we constructed three months ago, slightly around in March. So, I'll be just going through the July monthly review for the performance of the Philip 20 portfolio. So, before we actually uh, review the portfolio, uh, I'll just run through the price performance of uh, the STI for July and what has been happening for at least the first half of this year. So on the screen you can see over here, uh, this is the STI daily time frame chart. So obviously STI has been moving pretty nicely in an uptrend since around November of 2016 last year. And you can see uh, the STI has continued to make a series of higher highs and higher lows, which justifies for the uptrend. And ultimately you can see uh, what is sort of a propelling the STI higher in terms of a technical standpoint. Uh, can you guys hear me? Is there any te technical issues uh, with the volume? Uh, can somebody type into the chat box uh, if you guys can hear me? Okay, uh, I guess it's alright. Uh, we'll move on, continue to where I stop. So like I mentioned just now, I'll be talking about the STI price performance. So uh, on the chart again, this is the STI. Uh, what I've been saying is that STI has been moving pretty nicely in the uptrend since the start of this year and what has been sort of a propping the SDI up uh, you can see over here in terms of the technical price point is uh, the 20 and 60 day moving average which is shown by my red and blue line over here so every single time you can see when the STI sort of a dips below and moves into a correction uh, once it tests the 20 and 60 which is the red and blue line you can see some sort of a buying happening around the area which happens like three times uh, for the past six months so the two more recent case hit happened in April again, which uh, forms a, another higher low point as well as another point which happened around June to July this period. So all in all, the uptrend is still intact. But what I want to emphasize that happened in July was that you can see uh, somewhere around in May, the SDI has been stuck in a range bound kind of a price action for the two months period from May to around July period. Uh, around the two, 3 to 74 range high to the 3189 range low. So ultimately, the STI has been stuck between that range for the two months period and ultimately in July uh, what we got was a bullish breakout to the upside above the 3274 level and that sort of uh, justifies that the uptrend is ready to move ahead again uh, which is what the title is the uptrend is re-established so moving forward what we see for the STI in terms of a technical perspective is uh, we should continue to see STI moving forward to the upside and some possible target uh, on the STI for resistance level are the 3387 level followed by the 3458 uh, level. Uh, however, on the flip side, if there is any correction that would come into play, uh, what we would expect is, in order for the uptrend to sort of uh, still uh, validate itself, the red and blue line, which is the 20 and 60 day moving average, should continue to uh, play its role of supporting the price and the uptrend. And we should see prices continue to rebound off the 20 and 60 day moving average uh, for this uptrend to proceed uh, ahead. Uh, on the flip side, in order for the sentiment to change to the downside, the important and most crucial level to watch 
uh, in my opinion, would be this 3189 level. Uh, why so? Is because you can see uh, STI since around May, the level has been holding up relentlessly for the past three to four occasions, uh, shown by my highlighted areas. So you can see this previous resistance turn support area has been sort of a, a, a interest point to the market. And ultimately, if we do actually revisit this level and if this level give way to the downside, there's a high chance that the SDI might actually uh, move into a deeper correction. But as of now, uh, that shouldn't be the worry uh, as the uptrend still looks pretty healthy. And hence, we move on to what happened to our Philip 20 portfolio, which is constructed on our uh, technical criteria. So in July, uh, a total of five trades uh, were closed, three taken profit and two uh, hit stop loss. So as you can see over here, Sing, Med Sing Medical uh, was closed with a 55% gain, followed by China Aviation Oil and China Sun Team, with respective 9.7 and 8.7% gain. Uh, the reason why we closed out these three positions was because uh, there was some sort of a, a bearish sentiment kicking into the market, uh, which is why we sort of uh, taken profit on these three trades. Uh, nonetheless, the long-term trend for these three counters uh, remain firmly uh, on the upside and we'll continue to watch these three counters uh, for possible entry points to get back into the uptrend. And on the loss side, uh, unfortunately, United Engineers hit a loss of 9.06% as well as SOG with a 9.77% loss. So ultimately, they realized uh, average gain on an equal weighted basis of, of a Philip 20 portfolio uh, for the month of July uh, was up 2.74%. And then, obviously, uh, with the help of the uh, sort of a roaring SDI whereby you gain 3.2% for July, uh, the market movement within the bot based market was pretty uh, lively as well, which sort of uh, helped us enter into eight new positions in July. So these are the eight positions that we entered, uh, namely Black Gold, Franklin, HMI, HIP, MM2, Riverstone, UMS, and Valutronics. So the biggest dragger right now within this new entrance from July is Black Gold. Currently, uh, as of Friday's close price was down 17%. And then the biggest winner since uh, the trade was initialized, uh, HIP was the biggest winner with 25% gain. So net net, uh, all in all, uh, PNL for the new entrance remain relatively flat as of now. So I think we've got to give it more time to see the uh, performance moving ahead. For more information about uh, the rationale behind all these trades, uh, you can actually take a look into our technical pulse report, uh, whereby we actually hyperlink every single report to the uh, sort of uh, initial uh, entrance report that we actually came or come up with uh, in the entry date, uh, shown in the technical pulse report. Uh, and hence, with the new entrant and uh, stop loss and close position, the portfolio has been trimmed down to 16 stops. So we still have some leeway to sort of add stops within our portfolio. And here are the watch list that we are sort of uh, watching closely for some possible uh, entrants to sort of a few the 20 counters up for the Philip 20 portfolio. And last but not least, here is the uh, final updated uh, in 20 portfolio as of uh, Friday's closing price. So these are all the live trades that are still sort of uh, uh, playing out within the Philip 20 portfolio. And as of last Friday's close, the total average unrealized uh, gain and loss is uh, down roughly 1.3%. So to reiterate again, uh, how we calculated this particular gain or loss is uh, we actually place an average uh, equal weight of 5% on each trade, which means 5% weighing of each trade. Uh, from our 20 stocks within the portfolio. So past performance for May was up 3.37%, June was up 0.33%, and the most recent July performance was up 2.73%. So moving forward, we'll continue to update the Philip 20 portfolio for more new entrants as well as exits and uh, the monthly review that will come up every single uh, first week of the month. And just a bit on a uh, weekly uh, strategy report. So our team's view on the uh, weekly strategy report, uh, fundamentally we remain neutral on the STI target of 3270. Uh, sort of a theme for this week, Singapore Monday is a uh, macro nirvana, uh, basically because of the recovery in the global indicators, uh, namely in exports, IPI and PMI. 
which tracks better than expected data. And then inflation remains subdued, but uh, interest rate uptrend looks firmer with unwinding of balance sheet. And then last but not least, several sectors in the Singapore structurally challenged, uh, such as marine, transport, telecommunication, and retail. And some cyclical headwinds uh, are within this sector of construction and healthcare. And strategy-wise, uh, remain buy on sustainable EU and property. And hence, for you play, uh, we continue to uh, be optimistic for Asian Pay TV, CCT, uh, Maple Industrial Trust, Ascendos Reed, and for property, Capital Land, Will Lock, Chiping Singh, and others such as Hybrids Investment and Manyan Tree. Uh, with that, uh, we've come to the end of today's webinar. We'll leave the rest of the time for Q&A if there's any questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, there's a question on um, ESR in talks to buy Sabana REIT, what investors should be doing. Uh, we've already had a few reports uh, since January advising investors to buy, uh, so the view remains unchanged.
Hi, uh, there is a question asking about uh, whether to buy uh, China Aviation Oil at the current price of uh, $1.64, even that the oil price is on bearish trend. So um, here we should understand that the CEO space model has, uh, uh, has little business with the oil price itself because uh, it is, is it operates the trading basis which they under spread uh, between the uh, selling price and uh, buying cost. So uh, is the trading volume that matters for CAO spaces. Another point is uh, we should focus on the bottom line driven uh, investment which is the um, SPIA, uh, Shanghai Pudong International Airport uh, Fueling Company. So the driving uh, factors is, uh, are the um, passenger traffic as well as the air traffic. So in the long run, we are positive on the um, uh, C4 uh, aviation industry in China, especially um, China uh, will continue to open its market. Uh, so we think that um, in the future, the uh, uptrend uh, air traffic will drive up the um, uh, fueling volume which can translate into more profit to the bottom line of CAO and also um, based on the current price if uh, CAO can continue its uh, dividend policy uh, so we estimated uh, this year the um, dividend yield can reach around 3%. Hi, I got a question on developers. So the the question is about the risk that developers will overpay for the uh, price in the recent uh, land bidding and uh, and might translate into future write-off in the in in the I mean like uh, yeah future write-offs. So the the way to look at it is is as such. So demand-wise, uh, just in this year, we're talking about uh, a, a thousand. A, a thousand units in absorption. So compared to the past three years of 600, you can see that demand uh, has has accelerated uh, within within sh this short period of time. So in terms of why, why is this, why is this happening at this point of time is also that uh, in terms of supply, you are looking at close to a, a multi-year low. I'm talking about as much as like 10 to 13 year. So in terms of in terms of the demand and supply dynamics, demand. It's, uh, it's outstripping uh, the, the number of uh, uh, supply in terms of the uh, existing inventory. So, um, and there was a specific example mentioned about the Panorama, uh, which is uh, which is a development project by, by Wheelock. So just a bit of sharing on, on the Panorama. Panorama took uh, close to $120 million in diminution. And the reason behind it is, of course, like uh, of uh, potentially uh, lower selling prices. And then again, let's... It's, it's more specific because at a point of time uh, when Panorama was launched or when Panorama was launching, uh, it just hit one of the uh, next most binding cooling measure, which was the second tranche of ABSD. So uh, and also at that, during that point of time, supply was building and at the same time, demand was also dropping. So there's a divergence in terms of the uh, uh, demand and supply dynamics. And however, if you look at it today, uh, it's on a, on, a, on, a, on a totally uh, uh, different, uh, different sentiment. Hi everyone. Uh, 
uh, due to the interest of time, because we have another webinar which uh, we should be uh, we should be taking taking place shortly. So uh, we will we have come to the end of our presentation. So um, we'll see everyone next week.